Welcome everyone to the Judiciary Committee hearing this Tuesday morning. Um, with the new hybrid system, it's not so new anymore. Uh, if we have a, 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 a catastrophic crash of the Zoom system, we will try again on February 1st at 9.46 a.m. in this room 016 and we'll post a public notice. We do have a two minute time limit for testifiers, both on Zoom and in person. So a little buzzer will go off and there's a count, a counter, a countdown counter on the screen as well. First up today, we have, excuse me, SB 2240. This requires the Office of Elections to file an application with the Electronic Registration Information Center by the 1st of January, 2025 for the state to be admitted as a member of the organization. First up, we have Scott Nago, Chief Election Officer. All right, thank you and support Mary Healy. I think on Zoom. They're unfortunately unavailable on Zoom. In opposition, next is Jamie Detweiler for Hawaii Federation of Republican Women. Also on they're, Zoom. They're also unavailable. Okay, also in opposition. Uh, everyone else who signed up signed up uh, just for written testimony, and there's a lot in opposition. Um, couple of pages worth with one or two individuals in support. Uh, anyone else wish to testify on SB 2240? If not, members, questions? Senator Elefante. Yeah, question for Mr. Nagel. Thank you, Mr. Nagel, for being here and for your testimony. Really appreciate that. Um, question I have is, I know that it's going to cost about 125000 initially with the annual fee of 23,000 annually. Um, is, is there, how, what is the process now and how would this help um, the Office of Elections? So the process we follow, the current process for list maintenance is spelled out in the Federal uh, National Voter Registration Act. What this would do is it will allow us to share information with participating states um, that are members of ERIC. So it'll be more of a I don't want to say national, but it may have a national feel to it rather than just um, simply a Hawaii list maintenance process. And most states are already on the ERIC system. And my understanding was there were 22 states. It, and, then, and then the final question for that is, um, is there a reason why we didn't join earlier? Or is this sort of a new okay, program so national? Uh, it is nationwide? not a new program, but one of the requirements or the requisites to be a member of ERIC is you would, we would have to upload our driver's license file. Um, I don't believe DOT would allow that without some kind of act or a law change. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nago. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I did have a question. So in terms of what, what you just described to uh, Senator Elefante's question is we basically check internally for inconsistencies to be sure people aren't registered twice, be sure they haven't died, so that sort of thing. What we would do is we would bounce it off of... Um, but, so my question is, is there is there another way other than Eric to cross-check against other states? Because it seems to me like the risk we run, run in Hawaii is there are a lot of snowbirds. They can register to vote in Washington State and then come down here and register to vote, and there's no way to know... Is there another way to know, I guess? Yeah. There is another way to know, but it relies on the voter actually um, filling out the form. So, you know, when you register to vote and you fill out the form, there's one of the questions is, are you registered to vote in another state? If they say yes and what state there is, the clerks here would take that information. If we have an agreement to share with election offices um, throughout all 50 states, we'll take that list, compile it, and send it to that state. Just like I would get that list from other states that we can bounce off. But it, relies on the voter filling that out. So self-reporting on both ends. So yes. if a Hawaii resident went to California and checked off the box in California, then they would send us something back and say he's not Correct. You're not in Hawaii anymore. Yes. Okay. Um, with regard to the extra money you're asking for beyond what the bill says to start with, so with, I mean, we just recently moved over to um, Basically, if you if you get your license, your driver's license renewed, or you get a new one, you're asked whether you want to register to vote. Does do you, do you think this do, is this a recurring cost? Is this just a one shot deal where you have to do it once when we first join, or are you supposed to do it periodically? If you're referring to the mailing, yeah, it's a one. Mailing, yeah, I sorry. believe it's a one time thing to all driver's license state ID holders that are not registered. Okay. But even with the even with the new registration, you think it's still going to be because um, with the new registration, you can still opt out. But I still believe it's a requisite to join. So it, 
even with automatic voter registration, I'm not sure Eric would say that you don't have to do that anymore. Okay. No, I guess my question was, would, would, the, would, the, would the dollar amount have fallen because we were... It would, but it's hard to tell what that number is right okay. now. Okay. All right. Uh, can people hear in the back? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. Any other questions, members? Thank you very much for coming down. Thank you. Um, next up, we have SB 2319, proposing an amendment to, the, to Article 6, Section 3 of the Hawaii State Constitution to increase the mandatory retirement age for state justices and judges to from 70 to 75. First up on SB 2319 is Kat Brady for Community Alliance on Prisons in support. Michael Cruz in support. Ben Robinson in opposition. Lemomi Khan in support. David Loughton in support, Matthew Combe in support, and Stanley Rorick for the county, Hawaii County Bar Association in support. That's everybody I have that signed up for SB 2319. Would anyone, anyone else like to testify in SB 2319? Seeing none members, no one asked questions of, so we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, next up is SB 2332 requires the Judiciary Judicial Council to conduct a comprehensive review of the Hawaii Penal Code and to recommend proposed changes. The last one, I think, was eight years ago. First up on SB 2332 is Rod Miley, Administrative Director of the Courts, with comments. He's here or online. Uh, Director Tommy Johnson for the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Sorry, Director Johnson is kind of doing that. Okay. In, in support. Okay, thank you. Next is David Pullman, also in support. And that's all the testimony I have on SB 2332. Anyone else, would anyone else like to testify on SB 2332? Seeing none, members, questions? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, next is SB 2375. Relating to judges for the District Court of the First Circuit, establish one, establishes one additional District Court judgeship in the First Circuit. Um, there's already a budget for it, but there's no position in statute. First up on that is Melanie May, Deputy Chief Judge, the District Court, First Circuit. In support. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Jesse Suki, HSP, uh, Hawaii State Bar Association president, also in support. And that's everybody who signed up for SB 2375. Does anyone else wish to testify in SB 2375? Seeing none, members, questions? Uh, no questions. Let's go ahead and move on to SB 2376. This increases the rate of compensation and maximum allowable amounts per case for court-appointed counsel and guardian ad litem in family court proceedings appropriates money to declares that the, no, okay, that's just housekeeping stuff. Okay, first up on SB 2375 is Matthew, um, Judge Viola, senior judge and family court. Um, and he's here. Yeah. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair. I'll <clears throat> stand primarily on my written testimony. I would like to just make a, emphasize a, a couple of points. One is we do have a, a little bit of a troubling lack of a pool of court appointed attorneys who are available and willing to take these cases uh, as and the same thing goes for our guardians to light them <clears throat> since the stat this statute that we're asking to uh, amend a 571 87 in the 37 plus years it's been in effect there's been one increase in the statutory rates i think the last one was in 2007 about 17 years ago so we we think that part of the reason for having this somewhat limited and i think shrinking pool of attorneys and guardians of litem who are available to take these family court cases is the relatively low compensation and I think the stagnant compensation. So I'm um, available for any questions you've had. Any. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Darcia, Darcia Forrester, Office of Public Defender, Order Designee. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is William, mind pulling my name is, uh, William Bentheim. Just, just pull it towards oh, you a little. Okay. There you go. Yeah, Thanks. Right. Uh, William Bent, I'm a deputy public defender. I'm here for Ms. Forrester. Um, although, um, unlike the next bill on the agenda, um, 
these types of cases don't deal directly with uh, criminal defense work. Uh, many of the attorneys that handle these kinds of cases uh, in 2376 are also people that handle uh, the criminal cases for, especially for juveniles. Um, many of our clients are also represented by these individuals. And so having a shortage of quality uh, attorneys being able to handle these matters does make it difficult. It's a burden, um, not just on the court, but also on the clients. And so we'd like to grow that pool and I'd like to echo what Judge Viola said. Um, better compensation, I think, will do that. We'll be able to recruit new people to the pool, younger people, people that are willing to do this type of work for the long term, and that's really necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kathy Betts, Director for Department of Human Services. Uh, in support. Next is Jesse Suki, Hawaii State Bar Association President. Also in support, next is Shana Wailana Kukila on Zoom, I believe. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm going to just summarize my testimony, which was quite long. Um, I am a, a recipient of guardian ad litem services as well as court appointed attorneys. So I say these things with experience and also observations of others who have been through the system. So to summarize, I realize the value of court appointed attorneys. However, what are the measures of success for the state contracted court appointed attorneys? And also in the past, we see many high profile cases in which vulnerable children in the child welfare system are abused, missing and or murdered while in foster care. Cases like Ariel Sellers and Peter Boykema who did not survive the system. Who are their guardian ad litems? Are they held accountable for these lives lost? Did they fight for these children to be in safe homes and follow their contracts as independent investigators impartial to the state? That's a question that I have those cases. And also, is the judiciary as a whole currently compliant with the Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Violence Against Women Act? Um, next, why aren't state contracted court appointed attorneys also required to sign the contractors, contractor's standard of con conduct declaration as required by all other agencies and under their employers who are under the purview of the state? And lastly, I would encourage you all to attend the Malama Ohana Working Group to transform child welfare in Hawaii. Parents, children, and others in the system will be sharing our experiences and recommendations throughout 2024 and 2025. So mahalo for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you, we, members may have questions, so if you can hang around for a few minutes, that would be great. Uh, next is Doris Lum in support, William Bagasol in support, Brandon Siegel for Siegel Law, uh, Hawaii Law Corporation in support, David Lawton in support, Martin Bento in support. That's everybody who signed up for SB 2376. Does anyone else wish to testify in SB 2376? Seeing on members questions. Um, for Ms. Um, Kukila, if you don't mind coming back on. So with, with, with regard to the guardian ad litem, I mean, the, the guardian ad litem, as you're aware, is supposed to look out for the best interests of the person that they're assigned to. Um, do you have specific, I, I, we did read your testimony, but it, it was, I, I don't know, it, what, did you have specific instances where you felt like the guardian ad litem did something that was not in the best interest of the child or the, or whoever it was that they were guarding, the guardian for? Well, first of all, as you know, um, if you're getting assigned an attorney contracted by the state, you do not have a contract with them. So there's no attorney client uh, understanding. So if our children have a problem, say my child was uh, disabled, is disabled, and he was in the system for four years under a guardian ad litem who did nothing to help him, especially when he was abused on the school bus. He's a special needs child and the guardian ad litem was not qualified or interested in helping him. He visited him once a year and provided a brief report about his condition, but he never investigated fully the condition of the child. And so it ended up with a lawsuit against the state. Yeah, okay, and, right. um, so I just wanna make sure that you know that there's problems with the guardian <clears throat> item system. I'm not against raises, but I am um, looking for some answers to these questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judge Viola, can you come back up? So I'm, 
I guess that would not be what they taught me in law school anyway, that if, you, if the client is, well, the guardian ad litem is not necessarily an attorney, right? Uh, most of our guardians, uh, guardians ad litem are attorneys, are attorneys, but they're not required to be attorneys. They, they're not representing the child's, they're not the child's attorney. Okay. They represent so their there's best no, interests. So there's no attorney, no attorney client privilege attaches even if they are an attorney. Right. Okay. Um, so, I mean, this idea that somehow the guardian ad litem, what, what's the recourse if, if someone feels that the guardian ad litem is not uh, looking out for the best interests of the person? That, that's uh, a couple things. It depends on the, the specific status of the case. A child may be in, uh, assuming the child's in foster custody, that uh, the state has a responsibility as a parent to raise those issues. Those issues would probably be addressed in court. They can, they can ask for a, a, a different guardian. So who, who would that be? The Department of Human Services or the child, uh, uh, child, the, um, child welfare, whatever. Uh, child welfare, sir, uh, <laughs> Department of Human Services, Child Welfare Services, the uh, state of Hawaii would be the custodian of the child. Uh, they, but there, as long as there's an ongoing case, they'll be reviewed in court and the judge can address that in court. If, um, <clears throat> just as a aside in the first circuit, we do have a group that uh, we contract with to provide guardian ad litem services. Uh, we have our own program, a CASA program that performs essentially the same role. The guard, the group that provides the contract services, also if there are overflow cases or conflict cases, a legal aid provides guardian guardians ad litem in those cases as well. But, but, le but legally, the guardian ad litem is supposed to look out for the interest of the of the. I guess it's a. I don't know what that's called. A ward. Yeah, the child. Uh, yeah, the ward of the state. Okay. Yeah, that's their role is to represent the best interests of the child, not to not to act as their uh, attorney. Okay. Okay. Thank you, members. Other questions? If not, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to SB twenty three seventy seven. Yeah, I'll go back. Um, before we before we move on to SB twenty three seventy seven, a couple of people have showed up for the first bill, which was H SB two two four zero on the um, Eric uh, Electronic Registration Information Center, and so f at the at, with the uh, committee's uh, approval, we'll go ahead and go back to um, Mary Healy, I believe, if you're here online. There you are. Good morning. Hi. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, I want to thank you all for listening to my testimony. Um, I just would like to oppose this. Oh, you just cut out. I don't know why. Uh, they asked me to start the video. Okay, good. Um, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you for listening to my testimony today. Um, I would just like to oppose this bill. Uh, the ERIC system um, has been criticized and many states have been removing themselves from it. Um, there's a, a partisan issue with the ERIC system as to those who are operating the system. And then not only that, but um, it hasn't uh, hindered fraud. Um, in fact, uh, there are states like Connecticut that have, have, have been having voter fraud happen regardless of being a member of the ERIC system. And um, I just think for the um, safety of our citizens at large that we shouldn't be um, ad admitted as a state to the system. Um, it requires a lot of information to be shared, a lot of personal and private information to be shared, and uh, grateful that you came back to me. Um, and thank you for hearing my testimony on this matter. Thank you very much. We have one additional person who's come in to Jamie Detweiler of Hawaii Republican Federation, of, I'm sorry, Hawaii Federation of Republican Women. There you are. Good morning. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I apologize, I'm, I'm in my car, but I'm not driving. I assure you of that. Um, I oppose HB 2240 for the following reasons. Um, and I think some of those reasons have been previously mentioned, but I, I will go over three reasons. One are the privacy issues. So there are potential violations of federal stats statutes, including Help America Vote Act, National Voter Registration Act, and the Driver's Privacy Protection. As you know, and I'm sure all of you on the committee value your own privacy, 
So I ask you to take a step back and consider the uh, very um, important concerns that we bring to you. Some of the um, identifiers that they do use are your name, your birth date, and the last four of your social security number. So um, having a third party like the ERIC um, system, and may I remind everyone that the Electronic Registration Information Center is an incorporated private nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. So you'll be having somebody besides state employees handle this. Additionally, the next point is funding. The burden of funding this program falls sorely onto the taxpayers. And per their website, the ERIC website, it's funded by the state. So funded by we, the people that choose to join. And the last point, it does not prevent illegal voting. So in fact, um, it's been known that the use of ERIC swells and bloats are already bloated voter rolls. So um, again, I urge you to vote no on SB 2240, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. Aloha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any questions? Um, I do have one question for Ms. Detweiler, if you don't mind. Um, so there's a, there are quite a number of other states that have been members of ERIC for years, for maybe decades. Um, they've gotten around these the concerns that you've raised. How do you how do you account for that? As you heard from the uh, most recent uh, previous testifier, um, there are, I can't remember the number, seven states who recently pulled out because of these very concerns. So you're always going to hear two sides of the debate, and I respect both sides of the debate, but I want this committee to take into concern the very real issues of privacy and funding that our state is facing. We can't afford another burden on our taxpayers. Thank but, you, but, sir. <laughs> But you are aware, too, that the, the uh, voter registration lists are handled by um, private entities for campaign purposes, yes? Yes, anybody can, you know, any organization can promote voter registration. Um, but they, but they, actually, they actually get the lists. Yes, I'm aware of that, sir. Okay. And I'm All aware right. that we can request the list. So, but thank you for allowing me testify and for voicing the concerns of the people. Mahalo. Thank you. you. Thank, thank you for show, for being here. Other questions, members? If not, if not, we'll skip back to, let's see, where were we? I think 2377 was next, which is relating to compensation for court appointed counsel increases the rate of compensation and maximum allowable amounts per case for court appointed counsel in criminal proceedings. Uh, first up on 2377 is Ronald Johnson, Deputy Chief Judge, Criminal Administration, or a designee. Thank you. <laughs> good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair Rhodes, Vice Chair Gabbard, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jennifer Wong, and I'm the Staff Attorney for the Criminal Divisions of the First Circuit Court. Um, for the most part, we are standing on our written testimony that was submitted. Um, however, I just would like to point out that, um, in fact, the federal rate for non-capital cases uh, actually increased again January 1st to $172 an hour, and in capital cases, it's $220 an hour. Um, and also, I'd like to point out that uh, this last increase was passed by uh, the legislature in 2005, which brought us up to $90, uh, which at the time was the federal rate. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Next is Ben Lowenthal for the Office of Public Defender. Morning again. Good morning again. Uh, William Benta for the Public Defender's Office. Um, <clears throat> I think you're going to hear a lot of different testimony this morning, so I'm going to limit mine to my own personal experience. Uh, part of my duties as uh, working at the Public Defender's Office is to find and secure court-appointed counsel for cases that the Public Defender's Office has a conflict with. And so these can be co-defended cases, or sometimes our client is the complaining witness, et cetera. Um, I can tell you that I currently have a stack on my desk of several cases that are very difficult to find counsel for. Usually these are the most serious types of cases. And part of the reason is um, the limited amount of attorneys that are on the list that are qualified to handle these types of cases. 
we need to grow that list and we need to be able to have a reason for people wanting to do that and increasing the compensation would greatly help that uh, to be for us to be able to recruit people and have them trained and given the experience to handle these types of cases. I just want to point out one other thing. In the juvenile justice system, currently I've been told uh, by our supervisor in that area that there are three attorneys that are handling the conflict cases for juvenile matters. And these can be numerous because in the juvenile system, um, kids tend to do things together. So there's a lot of co-defendants. Um, two of them are semi-retired already. The other is a little older than myself, and I've been doing this for 36 years. Um, we're, we've tried to recruit one new person who signed up on the list, um, and that person is older than myself as well. So we need to be able to recruit new people to the list. I can tell you there are, there are people that want to do this work, but we're competing not just with the federal system, but with other private matters as well. And so that's part of the reason why we need to have this increase. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Jesse Suki for uh, Y State Bar Association president. Uh, in support. Next is the Hawaii Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen, chair, vice chair, members. Uh, we submitted testimony on behalf of uh, the Hawaii Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I am presently the vice president. I was previously the president of it. And like Mr. Bento, I've been practicing 37 years here in Hawaii. Um, I took myself off the court appointed list probably 20 some years ago. But periodically, I make myself available to be appointed on cases that other people don't want to take. So, for example, I presently have a case from the Big Island. Uh, Judge Kubota, uh, frankly, was uh, concerned that no one would take the case. I took the case on. It's a murder case. Uh, these are very uh, intensive cases, a lot of discovery, and a lot at stake. It's critical that we finance attorneys who are willing to do this kind of work. It's so, frankly, very often it's thankless work. And as Mr. Bento, who's been doing this for 36 years, um, often defense attorneys, in particular public defenders, are referred to as public pretenders. And that's unfortunate because they do the heavy lifting. I recognized that when I was a prosecutor under Charles Marsland. I recognized that for nearly four decades, that without the public defenders and as well as attorneys who go and do court-appointed work, we would be desperate. So I urged, you know, passing a, a bill that allows other attorneys who need to support themselves uh, to do likewise, to be able to uh, have an increase in their salary. And as testimony you heard regarding uh, federal uh, court appointment, the feds seem to be surprisingly ahead of the game here a little bit. Uh, and they recognize they need to have people who are willing to spend the time to do this kind of work. So I urge you to, uh, to consider that and to support that. We did submit testimony on behalf of uh, HACTL. HACTL is the local affiliate to the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, and they have gone throughout the country, state to state, making the same pitch. We need to finance this type of um, Thank public service. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming down in person. Thank you. Next, we have Lars Isaacson. Oh, right there. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. My name is Lars Isaacson. I'm a criminal defense lawyer here in town. <coughs> I've submitted written testimony. I, I think the only thing I might add as somebody who served on the CJA panel for a number of years here is sometimes I think people might have the idea that they just do garden variety, simple criminal defense cases mm -hmm. when really there's a whole lot more to it. Um, we do appeals. We do appeals as a CJA lawyer. I did appeals to the a court of Appeals in the Hawaii Supreme Court. I have cases pending certainly right now with the ICA. They do very serious crimes such as murders and other things. They do competency proceedings, which I am, have been involved in as well. Uh, they do somewhat complex things outside of just the normal criminal cases. There's the Veterans Court, the Mental Health Court. Uh, and these are the kind of things a lot of, oftentimes we deal with people who are very mentally ill people who have drug problems and a lot, sometimes a lot of what we do is uh, social work, is trying to get people in the right programs at times. So it's stuff outside of the courtroom and oftentimes we're at OCCC, 
where people have very serious problems and that's kind of where they end up being at. Uh, I would just say I think that so I, I very much support the raising of the $90 rate. I think it would allow more people to get involved. And, you know, sometimes we see the same attorneys over and over again, and we definitely need a new uh, breed or new, new more younger people getting involved to see in the CGA. When I say CGA, that's the federal, the court appointed panel here. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. You. Next is Brandon Siegel in support. Jeremy J.K. Butterfield. Also in support, David Pullman on Zoom, perhaps. They're unavo uh, unavailable on Zoom chair. <clears throat> uh, in support, <clears throat> Kyle Timothy Dowd in support, Wendy Hudson in support, Joshua James in support. If anyone's here and would like to testify, come on up. Richard Singh in support, David Lawton in support, Matthew S. Combe in support, Don Henry Laird in support, Jason R. Quiet in support, John Nober in support, Herman Heimgartner in support, Martin Bento in support, uh, William Heflin for Hawaii County Bar Association in support, Catherine Gibson in support, Carrie Ann Shirota for the uh, American Civil Liber Liberties Union of Hawaii in support, Francis L. Kane in support. That's everyone who's signed up for SB 2377. Would anyone else like to testify on this measure? Seeing none, members, questions? I have a question. Sure, Public Senator Walk. Go ahead. Public defender. Hey, um, and I heard Miles. I heard your testimony, and you know I'm coming in at this looking at well, this is another big raise, and I just talked about raises yesterday, and you know how taxpayers getting ripped off. Um, I understand you guys, you guys' duty um, to and the cases that you guys represent and the normal workload. Um, but does it have to be 150? Because in my mind, you know, we're public servants. We're all public servants. We make seventy-two thousand dollars over here. It's twenty-four-seven job, three sixty-five. We don't deal with, you know, having to save people from going to jail or stuff. But, but is the money the sticking factor? Is there anything else that can be done? And does it have to go up to one hundred and fifty? Could it be something less? Well, I think the amount that was chosen for the bill is something that's. Uh, comparable and also helps to be competitive. Um, many attorneys charge much higher rate for that type of work. And so I think it's a good number. Um, I think it helps to compensate the people that are currently doing the work and allows us to try to recruit other people to do it. Um, I, I understand that you know money is always uh, this pressure and people may tend to feel that it's not money well spent. But, you know, when I try to talk to young attorneys, um, I, I also am very fortunate to be a lecturer at the law school. I've been one for uh, over 20 years. And in trying to recruit young people to do this kind of work, I, I try to encourage them to understand that, you know, there's a few words in the Constitution um, that says the due process of law. And the people that do this kind of work breathe life into those words every single day that they walk into court. And I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but it's a fact um, that this is a requirement of our judicial system that a person be given competent representation in court. And, you know, we have to compete with all the other types of careers that people can have in the law. And so I think this is a fair amount of compensation and gives us the ability to compete with all those other avenues that young people have and also the federal court being $172. So on that, again, and forgive me if I'm not an expert in your field, but um, the, the kids that are coming up, there's no, there's no time. Like I'm doing this thing. I, I could have made a lot more money in the news. I'm doing this thing for the love of the people. There's not that kind of mentality with the younger folks. No, that there, are coming is, up. there, there is, there is, they want to do this kind of work because they want to give back to the community and be supportive of this. But at the same time, they also need to be compensated. Um, and, you know, we're talking about individuals that are more in the private practice than, than us who are gov government servants. <laughs> working for the public defender's office. So, you know, they could speak better to that type of work. But, you know, I, I do believe it's a situation where it's kind of a feast and famine kind of a thing. There are times when you have a lot of cases and times when you don't. 
And so, you know, you need to be able to balance that out over a period of time. And so, uh, you know, just like I said, as an example, you know, I have cases sitting on my desk where I'm trying to find somebody to take the case. Uh, and it's very difficult for these serious cases because they're busy. We've kind of saturated the group that, it, that are competent to take the most serious cases. I call them, I ask, I sometimes beg, and they're like telling me they're full up, they got too many, and they don't want to burden themselves with more cases than they know they can handle. And so that's why I think we have to expand this, this pool. But you know, the family court situation, I think is even more critical because as I said, there were three, two have semi-retired and these are individuals who uh, really are kind of doing it because they're trying to give to the public to be available because they know it's necessary. And it's even harder to recruit for that type of work as well. So, you know, this will go a long way, I think, in being able for us to grow that pool and bring in young people. But no, I, you know, they are dedicated. It's not just about money. Uh, regardless of the amount of money, you have to love what you do to be able to do this, no matter what the compensation is. Because as Mr. Isaacson said, we spend a lot of time not just doing legal work, but also work to help the individual become a better person. I appreciate the response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, we're going to back up. Uh, we have another testifier on SB 2377, uh, Shauna, I've lost her name. Well, anyway, there she, okay, Shauna Kukila, there we go. Right, go ahead. Aloha, Chair. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to um, testify on 2077. Um, add on to my um, testimony, I just want to remind everybody that the Two courts are connected. So if your child is taken, if you're going to be incarcerated, your child is going to be taken away. So um, these attorneys need to be aware and trained on constitutional rights, family law, all those things. So if you're going to give them a raise, I would recommend that they also be further trained by the judiciary instead of just thrown into cases because they're available. So um, that is the reason also I believe that there are higher rates of Hawaiian children in the foster care system. There's only 1% of the Hawaiian children in the whole population, and yet there are almost 50% of the population in child welfare. So their guardian ad litems need to do more if they want to have a pay raise. So this is what I'm saying about this um, bill as well. If they want a pay raise, they have to do more to lower those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll go back to questioning on SB 2377. Any other questions on SB 2377? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and proceed. The next bill is SB 2385. This proposes an amendment to Article 6, Section 3 of the Hawaii Constitution to place procedural restrictions on the timing of judicial appointments and confirmations during the, uh, the Senate's interim. There is no testimony on this, so we will move on to the next bill. Uh, which is SB 2521 relating to the Office of the Public Defender. This bill appropriates monies for four full-time equivalent deputy public defender positions within the Office of the Public Defender and it requires that one of the positions be assigned to the family court section. Uh, first up on this is John Ikinaga for the Public Defender. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. Um, so I submitted my written testimony already I would like to start out by thanking the generous sponsors of this bill for recognizing the understaffing issue with my office. You know, I set out in my written testimony, <clears throat> it is of critical importance to the judicial system that my office be able to fulfill its constitutionally mandated mission of providing representation to indigent defendants. My attorneys and staff believe in this mission, give their hearts and souls every day to our clients, but we are understaffed and underpaid. We don't have the resources of the prosecution and our salaries have fallen far behind. Um, every time the legislature creates new offenses, courts activate new specialty courts such as DWI or environmental court, it requires my office to further stretch its limited resources. And this bill would help alleviate some of the stress placed on my attorneys and staff due to our ever increasing caseloads. Um, I don't know if this is proper, but if possible, <coughs> I would ask that the positions be funded as PD3 positions. So statewide, our greatest need is for felony and felony <coughs> positions. And, um, in addition, we face significant challenges in um, 
filling PD2 positions, which would be the family court and the district court positions. On the neighbor islands, as the pay for those positions is inadequate due to the higher cost of living. So the cost of each PD3 position um, includes salary and fringe benefits is about $156,825. That includes a salary of $100,560 and $56,265 in fringe benefits, which is the standard state um, rate. <clears throat> Again, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this bill, and I'm available for any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is David Pullman in support, Antoinette, Antoinette Lilly, uh, Deputy Public Defender in support, Turin Tomasa in support, Wendy Hudson in support, Caitlin Martin in support, Sarah Haley, another public uh, Deputy Public Defender in support, Aubrey Bento, also a Deputy Public Defender in support, Caitlin Iwashita, in support, Carrie Ann Shirota, Policy Director of the American <laughs> Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii. In support, Barbara Polk in support. And that's everybody who signed up for SB 2521. Does anyone else, anyone else wish to te testify on SB 2521? Seeing none, members, questions? I do have a question for uh, the only testifier who is here. <laughs> Come on back up. Um, so you're suggesting all four positions be upgraded to the PD3? Um, Does that, because there's one that goes to the family court, is that a pro, is that fit with the family court too? Well, that, okay, so normally we'd have, we have PD2 positions in that. So that's about 84,000 salary position cost plus salary plus benefits is about 131. Um, the only reason I was asking for the PD3 positions is because, again, I said we have challenges in filling the PD2 position statewide. So um, if, I were, if these are funded as PD3 positions, I could move a PD2 position to family court to fulfill that and also um, put some positions, PD3 positions on the neighbors where they're very needed. Okay, so if we, if we changed it to... 156 825 times four and left in the provide and left in the provision that says you have to move somebody to family court. Yes. That would work. Yes, correct. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Senator Elefante, go ahead. Um, I have a question going back to a previous bill at the appropriate time, uh, Chair okay. for the well, Judiciary. Let's, let's finish up on this one first. Yep. And any other questions on this one? Um, if not, okay, thank you very thank much, you, and we'll go, we'll, we'll go to your question. Thank you, Chair. So, sorry for the trouble on that. No um, I want to go back to SB 2375 for Ms. Acosta. 2375. Relating to the judge's district court for circuit. Um, thank you for coming back up. I'm um, sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier in terms of, um, so currently right now, there are 14 district court judges. That's correct. And are all those district court judges filled positions? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then... In terms of planning, I know we're expanding out to Wahiwa. So does the judiciary look at an overall strategic plan on where to meet demands for more First Circuit court judges in those very outlying areas outside of Honolulu? Yes, currently the 14 district court judges are assigned to Honolulu district court, but they are assigned to the rural courts based on the calendars that are scheduled out in the uh, EVA, Kaneohe, Waianae, and Wahiwa. Words. And then this would just add an additional one, so it would make it total 15. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Other questions or concerns on that, Bill? Okay. If not, I think we're ready to go to decision-making. Is anyone, we, is everybody ready to go to decision-making? Okay. Yep. Uh, first up is SB 2240. This requires the Office of Elections to file an application with the Electronic Registration Information Center, Inc., by 1-1-2025. Well, the issue I'm concerned about here is, as I mentioned when we were having questions of the testifiers, is that we don't really have any way to cross-check with other states to see whether people are voting in more than one place. And this, this corporation has been around for quite some time, and there are still something like 22 or 23 states that are in it. So I don't think that the privacy, I mean, obviously, privacy is always a concern, and if you have a data breach, at any level, at the county or at the state or with a private organization, it's a big deal. But um, I, I would like to, I will be recommending that we move the bill forward with some amendments. So we'll cre increase the appropriation from 25 to 125, which is because Eric, and this is based on the Office of Elections testimony, 
because their membership requires that all people with a driver's license who are eligible but not registered to vote be sent a mailer encouraging them, encouraging them to register to vote. The cost of such a mailer would be $100,000. And according to the testimony, that's a one-shot deal. They, you don't have to do it every year or every five years or anything. And then also per the Office of Elections, we'll change it to the application has to be filed by June 30, 2025, instead of June, I mean, January 1, 2025. This is to allow for any administrative issues which could slow the filing process down. So that's the recommendation. Questions or concerns? See none, Vice Chair for the vote. Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 2240 with amendments. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator LaFonte? Aye. Senator San Buenaventura is aye. Aye. She's aye. And Senator Owa? No. Okay, the measure passes. Thanks very much. Next up is SB 2319. This proposes an amendment to Article 6, Section 3 of the Hawaii State Constitution to increase the mandatory retirement age for state justices and judges from 70 to 75. And this is a con am, so it does have to, uh, the voters have to approve. Um, recommendation is to pass unamended. Any questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Chair's recommendation is passed SB 2319, unamended of the members present. Are there any no votes or reservations? No. One no vote for Senator Owa. Measure passes. Thank you. Next up is SB 2332. This requires the Judicial Council to conduct a comprehensive review of the Hawaii Penal Code and to recommend proposed changes. Um, so I was on the last Hawaii mm -hmm. Penal Code review and the recommendation from that body was to do it once every five years and that was eight years ago the reason they wanted to do it once every five years was because the issues pile up over time and so the task becomes bigger and bigger the longer you wait so uh so my recommendation with that as background my recommendation is to pass it unamended the questions or concerns see no vice chair Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 2332 as is. Are the members present are there any no votes or reservations? Hearing none, the measure passes. Thank you. Next up is SB 2375. This establishes one additional district court judgeship in the First Circuit. As I mentioned before, the money is already there, but there's no position. Our recommendation is to pass as is. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Gabbard. Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 2375 as is. Members present, any no votes or reservations? No. One no vote for Senator Awa. The measure passes. Thank you. Next up is SB 2376. This increases the rate of compensation and maximum allowable amounts per case for court appointed counsel and guardian ad items and family court proceedings. Uh, the recommendation here is to pass unamended and note in the committee report that. Proceedings for assisted community treatment require an adequate pool of uh, guardian ad items. And yeah, that's it. Questions or concerns? Um, I'd just like to make a comment. Sure. I was one of those court appointed attorneys prior to becoming a legislator. And I can tell you, even at the old rate, it is not enough to have competent counsel. And when you keep the money slow, you don't you get there you get people who just like straight out of law school just for the experience and then you don't have the competent representation you are going to see hopefully with an increased compensation and um so i agree with sander awa i mean i'm also doing this for love i lost money by going into the legislature i lose money every time i take a court appointed case but i also see that if I don't take it and I've won my appeals that I get court appointed on, that when I see the ones who, when I see incompetence, I feel really bad for those who are convicted who did not need to be convicted. So, um, so I am for increasing compensation for competent, to increase competency in court appointed counsel. So just so we're sure, just so we're clear on this is not the the uh, court appointed court appointed counsel this is for yeah i'm sorry it is but this it is, is guardian ad items also which is not um not okay. necessarily an attorney so just so we know well other, it's going to be for both 2376 and 2377 yes because i served on both okay great it's uh, senator uh chair senator Blanc. 
A no vote for the previous one. I thought that this is the one we were voting. No, that's the one we're on. Yeah. That's what I was trying so to explain. I got to go back and change that other vote if possible. Which one? I'm sorry. The previous one I was going to vote yes on. 2375. I thought we were on 2376. My, my oh, hang on a sec. So 2375 would have been a yes for me. Oh, uh, I guess we can just reward. Okay. Not for the form, it's okay, but I just. Let's just revote on the previous one, I think. So we'll reconsider our. Um, our action on the 2375 and we'll revote and note that we're all voting for it this time if that's okay with everybody okay Thanks. okay okay back to 2376 uh recommendation is to pass on amended with uh, the note that i mentioned in the um, committee report okay chair's recommendation is to pass sb 2376 as is the members present any no votes or reservations no vote no vote for senator awa and the measure passes Thank you. Next up is SB 2377. This increases the rate of compensation and maximum allowable amounts per case for court appointed counsel in criminal proceedings. So that's the, the distinction. Um, just uh, as way of background, I, when I started practicing law 30 years ago here in Hawaii, well, when I started practicing law anywhere, uh, I was an associate at a tiny firm and my billing rate was $125 an hour. So I'm actually shocked that anybody will work for $90 an hour. And it's hard to imagine that anybody with any experience will work for that amount. So uh, the recommendation is to pass as is with a note. Um, I'm sorry, the group here, uh, pass as is with a note in the, in the committee report that is noted by the judiciary, there has been a dramatic decrease in the attorneys on the court appointed list of each circuit. And this has caused a shortage of available counsel to take in indigent defense criminal cases statewide and that's what we're, that's it so it's it's unamended with that in the committee report okay questions or concerns come senator wall so senator some one of it i totally understand what you're saying and, and, and from where i come from in the news when i went into the news we had reporters making ninety five thousand dollars. when i left those reporters were making forty four thousand dollars. the quality of what gets on is much different so i understand that it's just that and then i heard the testimony and i came in as a strong no Heard the testimony was closer to, you know, being for it. So I hear you guys, but I'm not quite there with the raise because it's such a big raise. I understand, you know, they deserve it, but not quite there yet. Okay. Other questions or comments, concerns? If not, Vice Chair Gabbard. Chair's recommendation is to pass SB 2377 unamended. Members present. Any no votes or reservations? No. No vote for Senator Owa. The measure passes. Uh, thank you, members. Next up is SB 2385. This proposes an amendment to Article, Article 6, Section 3 of the Hawaii State Constitution to place procedural restrictions on the timing of judicial appointments. More specifically, it proposes an amendment to the state constitution to place, I'm sorry, establishes a window between September 1 and November 30, during which the Judicial Selection Commission may not present a list of nominees to the governor or chief justice, provides that if multiple judicial vacancies occur between regular sessions of the legislature, the Senate shall be called into session into back into special session no more than twice. So what this does basically is between um, September 1st and the beginning of the session, there would not be any um, special sessions for judges. So the reason I'm, this is my bill, the reason I'm concerned about it is the, it's not costless for us to come back into special session. And we have come back into special session once or twice for two judges. And I think that we need to streamline the process uh, to save money and also to, to encourage those who are making the appointments to bunch their, um, their nominations together so that we can deal with more than two or three at a time in the middle of the summer when we have to spend quite a bit of extra money to bring up the neighbor, to bring up and down the neighbor island guys to be here. So that's, so there's no testimony. I think part of the reason there's no testimony is because it really only affects the Senate. Mm -hmm. So I'm recommending that we go ahead and move it on, at least for further discussion, even though I normally would prefer that there be some testimony. But so that's the recommendation, uh, as is, uh, for further discussion. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Gabbard. Recommendation is to pass SB 2385 as is. Are the members present? Are there any no votes or reservations? 
hearing now the measure passes. Thank you very much. Next up is SB 2521. This appropriates money for four full-time equivalent public defender positions within the Office of Public Defender. I'm going to accept the, or I'm going to recommend that we accept the um, proposed amendments by the Public Defender's Office. Uh, we'll go for four P3s at 156, 825 each, and we'll, we'll leave in the proviso or leave in the direction that one of the that's an extra person be assigned to family court judge on the family court section, sorry. And that I guess would be a PD two. Okay. So that would be the proposed amendment. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Recommendations to pass SB 2521 with amendments. Members present, any no votes or reservations? Hearing none, the measure passes. Okay, that concludes our business for today. Tomorrow we are off. Oh, we'll see you Thursday, though. Thanks very much. We're adjourned.